Hello, I'm Linda Ann Smith at Studio ABC. I'm a video creator for Paul Ver Paul at PaulVerPaulUSA.com. Join me in my studio to see how I make three-dimensional art with this amazing product. I'm wearing my gloves and I have a lamp that I bought at a thrift store. It's an electrical lamp, but I'm not going to need this cord. I'll be cutting that off in a moment. I also have some wire cutters some wire that I bought at Atwoods. This is fencing wire and some pliers to help me bend. These are little egg shapes, styrofoam pieces that I'm going to use to make the head. This lamp measures 24 inches in height and it's kind of hard to keep it all in my camera at the same time. But the first thing I'll do is cut that cord away. I don't even know if the lamp works, but I don't want this cord in it, so I'm cutting it off because this is a really neat base to begin an armature on. I'll be sure to dispose of that right away so somebody won't come along and plug it in accidentally. I'm going to pull off a nice long length of this wire and use my wire cutters to clip it off. As soon as I saw this lamp in the thrift store, I realized that that little irregular shape near the top of the lamp would be a great place to anchor wire to make an armature. And I have a special place in my living room where I want to put a nice elongated figure. So that's what I'm working on now. I could probably just tape this head on and anchor it later with the power pole, but I'm thinking if I hollow out the head a little bit later uh, and push it down over the top of that candle area, that it'll probably be more sturdy. I'm finding it almost impossible to hold it in view of the camera and manipulate the wire at the same time, so I may have to change my camera view the next time I make a project like this. But here we go. I'm, I had a nice long length of wire. I'm folding them to the center, and I will wrap those around the center. If these arms look too long to you, don't worry about that because I can wrap them around this uh, candle area until they're the right length and part of this is going to be the shoulders. I'll connect those two wires together in the center there and then I'll begin to twist the arms so that the wires on each arm will lap over each other, spiral around each other. That will strengthen up those arms and make them really a nice strong armature. The closer I get to the area that will make the hands, the more I'm going to need pliers to help me twist. Before I finish that armature, I'll go ahead and work on this egg shape now. It has a little ridge on it, and I'm going to use just the back end of my pliers to burnish that down. I probably won't get rid of all of it, but I'll get rid of most of it. And the hair is going to cover some, so I'm not going to worry too much about this. Just kind of, I, I just don't want a huge seam around the middle. Stopping to work on that egg shape gave me a little break from manipulating the wire, but I'm ready to go back to it now, and I'm going to try to figure out where the shoulders would go. I just realized one of the arms is a little longer than the other one, so I'm going to fix that by wrapping it around this uh, lamp pole until they come out even. And that's looking pretty good. I started wrestling with this wire and got it off camera, but basically all I did was just attach oh, the center of a wire and bring it out and twist it with the arms until it was long enough to be on the shoulders and then I brought it down to that uh, place that I've been talking about on the lamp to anchor it. I started to hollow out the head but decided I better mark it by pressing it against the top part of that lamp so that I can get an indention into the styrofoam so I'll know exactly where to cut it. When I get my camera back in focus here you'll see the indention. There it is. Very easy to know exactly where it needs to be cut to slide over that lamp pole. Then I used my small utility knife to cut around and cut the inside out, but I couldn't get it exactly smooth, so I used the end of the utility knife to push that uh, styrofoam into place so that it'll fit nicely over the lamp. 
and there it is. It works. I can either, it's a little bit tilted one way when I put it on. It might make it look more natural to give it a tilt like that. I'll make a decision when I actually start to attach it. Now bring out the good old aluminum foil. I really want this to be a very elongated stylized figure. I'm not concerned about it being totally in proportion. In fact, it's going to be out of proportion on purpose. Uh, her head may be just a little bit big for the shoulders that I made. I'm not quite sure. But I'm starting to build up some depth to give the doll dimension or the statue dimension. And then I'll bring it out on the arms. I use tape, but I find that my tape doesn't stick very well while I have. It really doesn't matter. All I need to do is have this foil in place until I get the pauper paw on. So even though my tape is not going to stick very well as I start using it, it'll hold it long enough for me to get the paw, first layer of pauper paw. This is probably the easiest step of making the armature. I find the wire manipulation is probably the most difficult. It's not difficult, but, but it gets cumbersome sometimes. And wrapping this and building up the dimensions with aluminum foil just seems very easy after that. That wire seems to know exactly where my hands are arthritic, which would be the reason that I rested for a minute and went to the head to work on it for a little while. I really don't need these gloves for everything I've been doing so far, but uh, I put them on and I'm kind of getting used to wearing them. I'm doing better. I am one of those people who really doesn't like to wear gloves. But maybe this is good practice for me to get used to them. It's not that hard to get it off of your hands, but I know that I may have an interruption here in a few moments. So I figured wearing the gloves, if I happen to have my hands in the pauper pole by the time the expected interruption comes, then it'll be easy to pop these off. So I popped them on before I began. I'll continue to wrap this foil around the arms and build up the depth, and when I get finished with it, I'll come back and show you. I've finished most of the arms, but I haven't done the hands yet, but some of this is trying to come loose, so I'll stop and just tape around it. And then I'll finish up the arms and the hands. When you dunk your bare hands into the pauper paw, you can peel most of it off once it gets dry, just like uh, peeling glue off of your hands. Removing it from your jewelry might be another story. It could loosen the stones if you had to manipulate uh, the dried pauper paw out of your jewelry later. And you never, never want to pour it down your sink. You'll pour the diluted trashy water down your sink and run uh, lots of water to flush it out. Also, when you're pouring out the water, be sure that you put a trap like a screen or a piece of hose over the drain so that it'll catch any of the fragments that might be in the water. You don't want that to go down your drains and have to call a plumber. And one tip we used back when I had an art room at school was to put a piece of pantyhose over the drain and that caught everything so we didn't have a whole lot of problems with the plumbing. I'm going to speed up the video so that this won't take so long for you to watch. I have finished the upper body part of the armature when I finish this hand, so I'll pop the head, the styrofoam head off, and I'll use a brush to seal it with the pauper paw. To make it easier to manipulate, I'm going to push a brush handle, a long brush, up into that egg shape before I seal it with the pauper paw. That way all I have to do is just pop it into a bottle to let it dry, and that uh, brush holds it up out of the way. The reason I'm dabbing some of the pauper paw onto the body is because I want to have a sticky tacky surface there 
for the Pauver Paul pieces to stick to. I need to tear the fabric into strips. I'm using muslin today. Let me show you the method that I've found easiest for me to use for wetting down the strips. I've popped a board into a Hobby Lobby sack, any kind of plastic sack, and then I put down a strip of the fabric. I called it a strip, but it's a wide piece. This catches all the extra pauper paw that I brush onto these thin strips because later I'm going to be using a large piece and it'll already have some pauper paw on it. There are many different methods for applying pauper paw to your fabric, but I've found this is the one that works best for me. I'll pull a couple of these strips diagonally over the shoulders and then I'll start to wrap the arms by just spiraling the fabric around the arms. It's very similar to working with paper mache and you might find a different method that works better for you. That's fine. I think you should do it the way it's easiest for you to manipulate the fabric. Sometimes it tries to fold up on you and sticks to itself. You can just pull it back apart when that happens most of the time. Now there are a few fabrics, some of the thinner polyester type fabrics, that the edges will really roll badly. But on this muslin, it's fairly easy to work. This is only my third or fourth project with Pauver Paul, and I'm already beginning to feel very comfortable with using it. When the upper body's all finished, I'll use much larger pieces for the skirt. I'm bringing the corner of a large wet piece up to the overlap the top area, the torso of the statue, and then I'll try to bring this down to the base. I manipulated for a little while and decided that it really wasn't going to work without something to hold it out. It did, but it didn't work um, quite as efficiently as I wanted it to, so I finally went back and added some foil to the bottom. I made a Native American figurine similar to this on a video before, but I could not get the height and sturdiness that I'm getting with the lamp. And this one will be different in clothing also. Once I had that foil intact, I could make the fabric stand away from the base much easier. It kind of falls apart when I turn it over to try to show you on camera, but I wanted to show you that it takes more than one piece. You have to overlap the pieces to uh, make it go all the way around. I'm getting some pauper paw on the, on the base. That's no problem. It dries clear. This is the transparent pauper paw that I'm using, by the way. Making sure at the top that I attach each piece to the torso before I bring it down to the base and that way it locks into those other pauper paw areas that I've already finished on the top. I like to smooth it out and put it in place where I want it and seal it together with the other pauper paw seams, but then the final thing is that you just want it to drape naturally for the beauty. Let's take a look at how it looks now. I'll put the head back on to dry it because the next step will be attaching the head, but I'm giving it some drying time first because I want to take advantage of the sunshine that just peeked out from behind the clouds. To make her face color, I'm going to add just a tad bit of primary elements, because it's sparkly, to some of this basics paint that you see. I have a little puddle here on the side. And I'm going to mix that together to give it a more uh, luminous appearance. I don't want it to be super flat. So, there's the primary elements and the basic paint, and I'll just paint this on to give her a skin color. I think even you can tell there between the tube and the color that I'm brushing on that it's a little more sparkly like skin. I'm going to let this dry while I go back to my figurine because I can see that I'm going to need a second coat to this later. So we'll give it some drying time and I'll start working on the figurine again. 
I debated on whether or not to do some dry brushing on this and the dry brushing one over. I really liked the white buckskin dresses that they used to wear. Uh, the doe skin dresses were so pretty. But I decided that this will look richer and better if I add a little color to the base. So that's what I'm doing and I'm using Vivid Ultra Metallics to uh, work on that. I actually put a drop of water. It really takes only a tiny drop of water to make a wash out of this. And then I dry my brush off on a piece of fabric to where there's almost no paint in it whatsoever. And then I brush over the top of the whole thing with the Vivid. So it's time to work on the bodice. I have fringed a piece of rectangular muslin on two sides of it and then I've blocked off with a, a colored pencil an area that I want to decorate. And now I'm using, I put some Vivid Ultra Metallics into this fine line applicator and this is really neat. I can just make it look like little beads on her bodice here. It is a teeny tiny little fine line and the neat thing about it is it has a uh, lid with a little needle in it that goes down inside of that thin uh, applicator. Here's the paint that I'm using. This is Vivid Ultra Metallics and I've got it in here in the fine liner. As I was saying, that pen goes down inside of the bottle to keep it from stopping up. And I had the time trying to get it back on until I realized I was doing it wrong. There's two parts to this bottle, so if you get one of these, uh, experiment with them a little bit because it's very easy to put the lid back on. You don't have to match up that hole to the little pin. Once I got started with this, it just went pretty fast and it, was, it looked good, so I just kept going. I'm pretty much covering up that pencil line. Uh, it... It's not going to matter because later I intend to do a little painting, a little uh, wash around these. So it's not going to matter if there's a little pencil line there because it's going to disappear later anyway. I plan to split this area later right in the center and place it over her head. So I just kept adding dots and it was kind of therapeutic. I've been doing a lot of projects and staying up really late, so here's where I started getting tired and made lots of goof-up mistakes. I started putting the popper paw on the wrong side of the fabric when I was done with all the painting and, and all the decoration. I put it on the right side. I should have put it on the wrong side. So I realized what I've done, and I decided to flip it over and work on the back. That's parchment paper. That glue won't stick to it. Everything's fine, right? <laughs> Wrong. I had already figured out how I was going to keep this fringe from tangling. I'd just comb it out once it had the popper paw on it. That was going to be simple, right? Uh, well, when you're tired, nothing's simple. <laughs> because when I flipped it over, it stuck to itself. But a lot of art is problem solving, so I certainly had my share of it this day. I did a lot of problem solving. So I just went ahead and got it wet because I thought I'll just put it on the doll and fix that other side when once I get it on her. And it really didn't turn out too bad that way. I was able to do a fairly good job. I took the comb after I got it over her head and worked on it and pretty much came out like I expected it to. So I take my little utility knife and I cut it the wrong way. 
but it actually in the end it doesn't make any difference because it went over her head just fine and you couldn't tell where I had cut the fabric. And I'm thankful at this point that I hadn't actually glued her head on as I had intended to earlier. So I'm just arranging this and I'll take the comb and comb out that fringe and everything's going to look really pretty. The biggest challenge for me in making her was trying to figure out how I was going to do her hair. It seems like there's all kinds of ways to make curly hair or wavy hair, but I wanted straight Native American looking. And I didn't want to glue it on one strand at a time. Uh, the beating with the paint was therapeutic, but I didn't think that one strand at a time was going to be very therapeutic for me. So I mixed some Aline's paint with the transparent pauper paw. There's just a little bit here in the bottom, and I mix it very thoroughly. And so it turns gray, but I'm not too worried about that because, because what makes gray? White and black make gray. So the white is going to turn transparent. I'm thinking the black's going to come back, and that was probably pretty good thinking. It worked. Last time when I made the Native American doll, I used fabric and draped it into hair shape. But I wanted a different look on this doll, so I'm experimenting with different things. I decided to just apply this like a paint directly to the head form. And I was very lucky because when it dried it looked black and I liked it. I had to put a couple of layers on it, but it was fine. I found this old Halloween wig in some of my junk drawers. And I thought, well, I can use that somehow, but I couldn't figure out how to keep it all together once I cut it apart to put it on the head. I knew that I could change the color, but how was I going to keep it together? So I ended up in Bentonville, Arkansas, while I was still trying to think this over. And they have a super-duper bargain basement room in the back where you can get good deals. And I ended up finding this. I bought all they had, which was two. I decided to keep it intact and use only one in the back of her hair, hanging down her back. So I cover it with the Pauver Paul mixture that has the black paint in it. I finally decide that I'm going to need some gloves and I put on my gloves because I want to open up the center and make sure that the Pauver Paul gets all the way down to the inside of the tassel. And of course, it's not the same shape that it was, but I really didn't want it in a tassel shape anyway. I'm spreading it out so that it looks more like a very thick ponytail. Now I'm going to take this outside and lay it over a bow curved because it needs to be curved fit to fit up against her head and down her back. And it was worth every moment that I spent on her. I cannot wait. I'm redoing my living room in Native American, and I can't wait to give her a special place in my home. If you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up and check all the links in the description box below. I'll tell you how to find Pauver Paul, and all of my links will be there too, including one to Facebook page Studio ABC.